Θα μου επιτρέψετε να παρουσιάσω την Δόκτωρ Καρναβά στα αγγλικά, γιατί έχουμε και συνάδελφου από το εξωτερικό. Dear colleagues, dear students, I'm glad to see some students here, although it's exam period. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's lecture by Dr. Artemis Carnava, whom I would like to uh, welcome to the Archaeological Research Unit. We are all looking forward to her lecture uh, this evening, which has created a lot of interest. Uh, I think a lot of people are also watching online, from the US to Oxford to um, elsewhere. Uh, Dr. Carnava studied uh, history and archaeology at the University of Thessaloniki before moving to Sheffield to do an MA in archaeology and prehistory. She then moved on to the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium for a PhD in history of art and archaeology, where he fo she focused on the study of ancient scripts and uh, mainly, initially, the scripts of the Aegean, Linear A and Linear B. Uh, and of course, this eventually led her to the interest of um, Cypriot inscriptions and the Cypriot syllabary, which has derived from um, these scripts. She has held a number of postdoctoral positions uh, at the University of, uh, the Institute of Classical Studies at the University of Vienna, before that at, the, uh, at, at Belgium and Cambridge as a visiting uh, fellow. Um, she, the, her latest position was at uh, in Berlin, where she has been in charge uh, uh, working on the projects of an inscription as Greek, and she's working on Cypriot material, if I'm not mistaken, for that, um, and is almost uh, ready to publish the material that she has been working on. And just um, a month ago, uh, her new book has come out, or on uh, the uh, inscriptions from Thera. And this is also open access and it's available online for anybody who is interested to have it. So this evening she will talk to us about perceptions of language and scribal practices in Cyprus during the first millennium, the focus of her recent um, research in, on Cypriot material. Thank you very much. So. Thank you very much all for coming here. Um, I would like to start a little bit with uh, saying why I am here, why I came to Cyprus. So this, um, I think I will call it adventure. It started many, many years ago, around 2007. My um, former supervisor, Jean-Pierre Olivier, he had been working on Cypriot scripts, the Cypriot Minoan, as well as the Cypriot syllabary for some time. But um, at that point of his uh, life and his career, he was not um, willing to do a corpus of these inscriptions, which he always thinks that is imperative before you start working with a specific writing system or a language. So um, he asked us, and by us I mean at the beginning myself, his student, and Massimo Perna, a colleague, both of us, we are actually prehistorians in our second lives, <laughs> or our first lives, and this is our second lives, and we come from the field of Linear B. And this is our affiliation with the Cypriot syllabary because all these writing systems are connected, and it seems easier for people coming from that field to study the syllabary rather than someone coming from the field of classical epigraphy, alphabetic ep epigraphy of the first millennium. So, um, we were joined in our effort by Marcus Egetmeyer, a colleague of ours who is a linguist, basically, and he's, a, um, I think, whoever has um, read anything about the Cypriot syllabary may know him. Uh, his specialty is the uh, Cypriot dialect, the ancient Cypriot dialect. So we joined forces, and it was Marcus's idea to reach out to the Corpus of Inscriptiones Greke, which is the series that publishes all the Greek inscriptions throughout the Greek world, and to ask them if they were interested to include our work in the syllabary, in uh, the corpus series. As it so happens, its director, Klaus Halloff, um, he has, his notion is that the corpus should involve everything in the Greek language, no matter which writing system it is written in. So in this respect, the Academy of Berlin always had a project of including the Cypriot syllabary, a different form of Greek, but still Greek, and it was very fortunate for him that someone volunteered 
someone came up and said, we want to do this. So it was um, a good um, a marriage of opportunity, I think. <laughs> and the result has come after many years of uh, hard work in the storerooms. We have been excavating storerooms to find all the old inscriptions to rediscover them. Uh, and we just submitted the manuscript or, of our first volume to be published by the Greuther at the beginning of next year. So the first volume includes material from uh, the regions of Amathus, Kurion, and Marion. I have to say that the division of the material was a bit uh, accidental, <laughs> shall I call it. Uh, we thought of dividing the work in um, three uh, volumes. And because we have a total of 1,300 inscriptions, we thought that each volume should contain more or less 400 inscriptions. So we looked for the places that added up <laughs> to 400 for one volume. Uh, the second, our second, this is the first volume. The second volume will be Paphos because Paphos is quite prolific in its epigraphy and we have more than 500 inscriptions. It is a difficult material, so uh, there was no way that we could have done Paphos first. <laughs> We thought we would start with Marion, because Marion is uh, relatively, um, the inscriptions are well preserved, so it was good for beginners. Of course, we were wrong, but anyway. And the third volume will be the rest of the island, which doesn't have that many inscriptions, and all the inscriptions that were found, separate inscriptions that were found outside Cyprus. So this is my short story of the involvement, and I would also like to take the opportunity to present to you my colleague Massimo Perna, who is Italian. He has drafted uh, an agreement with the authorities of a community to the west of Sardinia in Oristano. And he established, and that was the opening on Friday, just this Friday, a study center for Aegean and Cypriot scripts. Uh, he gave it the name of Pierre Carlier. For those of you who know, Pierre Carlier was a French historian a very dear friend and an excellent scholar who passed away some years ago. And Massimo was his student, so he wanted to honor the man. And it was a good coincidence that Jean-Pierre Olivier and Frida van den Abel, whom you know, um, they donated their private library and their archives to the center. So the center will now be based in Sardinia, which is open for everybody to visit and study in the future with the Aegean scripts and the Cypriot scripts as well. So uh, this is Jean-Pierre's and Frida's archives, how they were settled. And I'm showing you the picture on the right. This is Massimo's office. Above his office, he has the drawing that he did of the big Amathos inscription, which is in the Louvre. It's two and a half meters long. And he has spent many sleepless nights drawing that uh, inscription. We have had many, many quarrels over the years, and uh, it's his masterpiece. He's very proud of that. So this is what he chose to put above his <laughs> desk, which is very nice. So I think, let me, OK. So we can actually start with my talk now. Starting with the island of Cyprus, which we are on, is located, as you very well know, in the heart of the Eastern Mediterranean but it constitutes a provocative study case for literacy studies. Because of its position, but because also of its natural resources, namely copper, it functioned throughout its history as one precious prize to have and to hold, but most of all, to exploit. Much like other islands of the Mediterranean that were situated in privileged crossroads, such as Malta and Sicily, it became home to a number of peoples, as well as their respective languages and cultures. Among the people who inhabited the island during the first millennium BC, there are two fields of communication that we are presently interested in, and that is language and writing. Of course, there are other cultural characteristics that could be examined, such as art or architecture, evidence for religious beliefs, um, or administrative and economic practices, but these are already and could further be the subjects of numerous studies. So in an island of little over 9,000 square kilometers, at least three languages were spoken during the first millennium BC, Greek, Phoenician, and the poorly understood Ethiocypriot. 
It is known that the dominant language throughout the millennium was Greek, in its local dialectal form, Cypriot Greek. Greek is thought to have been introduced to Cyprus from the 11th century, mostly from the 11th century BC onwards, by Greek-speaking populations that inhabited the island. It nonetheless became dominant through processes that are largely unknown to us. And uh, it is this language that is attested in the majority of the inscriptions that we have at our disposal. The conventional, modern, invented term, Ethiocypriot language, to go to our second language group, which by analogy with the Homeric Ethiocretan is to be understood as true Cypriot, is used to indicate one or even more uh, local languages that presumably pre-existed the arrival of the Greek-speaking populations and the Greek language, and survived well into the first millennium. A small number of first millennium inscriptions that can be dated as late as the fourth century BC testify to this language. The third is a language that is omnipresent in the, Mediterra in the Mediterranean, namely Phoenician. Phoenician appears to have been spoken and written mainly within the confines of the Cypriot kingdoms that were ruled by Phoenician rulers and are thought to have, be, to have had a significant portion of Phoenician-speaking populations, such as Kition in the southeast part of the island, and Idalion, an inland kingdom, which at some point of their history also constituted a united kingdom. Along with the pluralism of languages attested in the first millennium, a fact which is by no means peculiar to any place of the globe, exceptionally, we also have a pluralism of writing systems. Historically, we know that a number of languages can be accommodated under the same writing system and vice versa. But language being a natural institution, while writing constitutes a human-generated technology, they are not always inexorably linked. Writing, in particular, can be invented, adopted, imposed, or discarded at a pace other than that of language. So, although the two are usually examined together, they present us with different phenomena and attitudes, and here, in the case of Cyprus, we have just such an instance. So, although it is thought that the Greek language dominated, it was not written down by use of the Greek alphabet as was the case with the rest of the Greek-speaking world, at least from the 8th century BC onward. An exclusively Cypriot native script, a syllabary, was used to write Greek between the 8th and the 3rd centuries. This phenomenon can be explained on the basis of historical reasons. The first millennium Cypriot syllabary is believed to derive from local writing systems, the so known as Cypromynoan, used during the second half of the second millennium BC. They, in their turn, are suggested to have been an offshoot towards the east of the Cretan Linear A script, much like Linear B also was. All of these systems, Aegean and Cypriot, belong therefore together to a family of at least five syllabic Cypro-Aegean writing systems, spanning primarily in the second millennium and surviving exceptionally in Cyprus in the first millennium, at a time when alphabets of all kinds and varieties were invented and adopted in the Mediterranean. The first millennium, which saw this tremendously successful expansion of the alphabet, left Greek-speaking Cyprus largely indifferent, reinforcing once more the suggestion that writing can follow a trajectory totally different than language. And in the slide, you see here a stone inscription in the syllabary in the way that we chose to present it in the corpus, it's, uh, we always have a photo, and from the photo we produce a drawing of the inscription, and then we give a transcription of the text in computer fonts so as to help people decipher a little bit the individual signs, and then we have a transcription in syllables, much like the way we do in Linear B. Sometimes we suggest tentatively a transcription in Greek characters, but we don't often engage in that because there are a lot of problems with transcribing in Greek characters. So the syllabary is attested in Cyprus in two varieties, the so-called common, since it is used all over the island, and the so-called Paphian, the name deriving from the region of Cyprus in which it was used, namely Paphos in the southwest. 
The differences between them lie in the different forms of certain signs, as well as the direction of writing and reading. Paphian, much like its siblings linear A and B, is written from left to right, whereas the common syllabary is sinistroverse, like the Phoenician alphabet and all Semitic scripts. Again, this can probably be explained on the basis of historical reasons, but such a discussion is beyond the purposes of this presentation. The inscribed objects preserved to this day comprise stone inscriptions on metal and clay, stone inscriptions, inscriptions on metal and clay, sorry, vases and statues, uh, bone, inscri inscriptions on bone, seals and coins. Their content is most of the times, and I'm speaking about the stone inscriptions, a funerary formula or a dedication, whereas an object could be dedicated to a deity. The unique bronze tablet of Idalion, which I'm sure you all know, contains a lengthy legal document. But we know for certain that other perishable documents existed since paint was used on vases, like you see here on the left, and painted inscriptions present us with what the version of the syllabary would have been, would have been had it been written on parchment or papyrus. More importantly, we are missing the documents that pertain to the public sphere, such as administrative and archival ones, for which we have good evidence that they existed. The gradual discovery in the past 30 years of an important palatial archive in Idalion of some 700 ostraca in Phoenician and some 30 in Cypriot syllabic uh, is only a reminder of the evidence that we are missing. And as a final general point, if we add all text categories mentioned previously, overall, very few separate syllabic texts survive, as I told you previously, some 1,300, unfortunately. So, a miniature statue from Cyprus, kept at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, offers vital evidence on literate persons in ancient Cyprus. A man sits in front of a table with a papyrus or leather roll on it. I venture to guess that it is some sort of leather roll, since a funeral inscription from Marion attests to the profession of difteralifos, a word explained by Sihius as teacher, grammatodidaskalos. Teacher, the word used only among the Cypriots. Diphthera, skin height, as a writing medium, is mentioned by Herodotus. The Ionians, says the passage, uh, have also, from ancient times, called sheets of papyrus skins, since they formerly used the skins of sheep and goats <coughs> due to the lack of papyrus. Even to this day, there are many foreigners who write on such skins. It is most likely, therefore, that this statue represents a teacher whether a teacher also served as a scribe in the sense of a person responsible for the drafting of archives and correspondence, it is not clear, since we have hardly any evidence for scribes in Cyprus. The statue constitutes evidence, however, of writing media other than the ones that have been handed down to us. For the time being, we can testify that there was probably no cursive version of the script, but scribes on all their writing media made it a point to keep signs well apart and detached. So other than the native Cypriot syllabary, the Greek alphabet, as well as the Phoenician alphabet, are attested on the island. Sorry, no, that was the next slide. On this slide, in order to give you a brief idea of how the syllabary functions, this is my favorite slide, I show it in all the in all my presentations. I use this example, which is very convenient because my name is attested in all three writing systems that were ever used for uh, the recording of Greek. So uh, this is how my name is written in, um, in the alphabet, as you well know, in the Cypriot syllabary in the middle, and uh, that's a bonus, uh, linear B on the right. So you see that each writing system has its own conventions uh, the Cypriot syllabary makes it a point of taking down every consonant. They don't leave anything out. Linear B, on the other hand, for instance, when they have two consonants, one after the other, they chew up the first. So we don't have, from 
uh, R and T, we're missing the R when we write it, and they don't bother writing the final S. So it's more economical in a sense, whereas the separate syllabary, they took down everything. They were more precise. So uh, this slide covers all the three writing systems that have been employed throughout the history of the Greek language with the alphabet, as we know, being the ultimate survivor and winner. So other than the native syllabary, the Greek alphabet, as well as the Phoenician alphabet, are attested on the island. The Greek alphabet is introduced as late as the 6th century, but it clearly constitutes a cultural import. And it seemingly takes a long time to catch on, since the main bulk of locally produced alphabetic inscriptions date from the 4th century onward. The Phoenician alphabet, on the other hand, goes hand in hand with the Phoenician language and the Phoenician-speaking populations that settled in Cyprus. Here you see an ostracon on the right from the Dalion archive, a logistic economic record produced by the palatial administration written in Phoenician. So all these languages and scripts did not function in isolation. Instead, they coexisted and intersected in various combinations, as did the people who spoke them and wrote them. Sometimes they do give the impression that they mostly kept to themselves, but the known to us instances where they met provide us with some interesting clues about cross-cultural relations, affiliations, and barriers. One of the ways of examining their relations, and by consequence the relations between their users, is by examining bilinguals. The term is, in fact, rather inaccurate, since while it refers to the use of different languages in the same inscription, very frequently and erroneously, it also covers for inscriptions that appear in different writing systems. So while it has become a blanket term, it is more precise to also introduce the term by scriptural or digraph for inscriptions that appear in more than one script, but also not necessarily in different languages. A case in point is the famous Rosetta Stone that you see on the slide. Uh, it is an inscription that functioned as the key to the decipherment of the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And while it is, for all intents and purposes, a bilingual inscription, because it attests to the Egyptian and Greek languages, it is a digraph, or to be more precise, a trigraph, trigraph. Because the Egyptian language is re recorded by two different scripts, employed in Egypt at the time, the hieroglyphic and the demotic. These inscriptions, bilinguals and digraphs, have attracted much attention from the 18th century onward, when a variety of long forgotten and seemingly mysterious scripts were rediscovered, while scholars puzzled over their reading. The 18th century saw the decipherment of Phoenician in the 19th century, the decipherment of the Egyptian hieroglyphs, which you see here, and the Cypriot syllabary. In all these instances, decipherment came about with the assistance of bilingual, with the assistance of bilingual and or digraphic inscriptions. So digraphs have always been highly regarded and prized in scholarship. But their usefulness in the case of first millennium Cyprus does not end with the decipherment. They have much more evidence to offer us, especially now that a considerable amount of time has elapsed since the decipherment and we have a more profound understanding of the writing system. For our discussion here, it is, the bilingual, it is not the bilinguals that I will deal with, but the digraphs. First millennium Cyprus is not only a playing field of languages, but also of scripts. Suffice to say that there's evidence for bilingualism in Cyprus, some of which is even evident in some of the inscriptions I will show you, but here we will first focus on the digraphs. So um, the pair of scripts that we have more evidence for is the Cypriot syllabic and the alphabet. It does not happen every day that a language is written by two completely different in their structure writing systems, but when it does, it allows us for some noteworthy cultural insights. I chose to arrange our relevant evidence in three different levels that appear to represent different social functions within the ancient Cypriot society. The first level is the higher, the official, as expressed by coins and their legends, as well as royal or civic dedicatory and honorific inscriptions. This level contains inscriptions that are produced by a state authority. 
They intend to diffuse state ideology and they make use of formal means of expression. The inscriptions at this level express the dominant ideology and they were meant to be eloquent and forceful in this regard. The second level is the semi-official, semi-private, which can be seen through tombstones of private individuals and their inscriptions, or through signature graffiti by military personnel in Egypt, or through the objects dedicated to deities. A tombstone is, on one hand, a private statement containing the name, the patronym, and what other evidence the family of the deceased saw fit to fill in, but its place in a public space, a cemetery, makes it at the same time public record. The same can be said for the person carving their name on an Egyptian temple or a person dedicating a vase or other objects. Although private statements or statements made by private individuals uh, and statements made by people under no official capacity, the signature addressed a potentially wide audience. <coughs> the third level is the, so to speak, private as it is expressed through vase inscriptions, uh, post-firing vase inscriptions. I refer here to ownership inscriptions that were incised on Attic vessels, mostly during the fifth and the fourth centuries BCs, in their majority cups, which in their turn ended up accompanying the dead in their tomb. Or at least tombs uh, is where we get most of our evidence of this sort. The fact that such inscribed vessels have also been retrieved from habitation sites, makes it more probable that the original intent of these post-firing inscriptions had been the declaration of ownership, while the owner was still alive and not its mere deposition as a grave good. There is, however, also good evidence, primarily de uh, deriving from the extensive Marian cemeteries, that some ins inscriptions were made on purpose in order for the vases to be precisely deposited as grave goods. These categories are not absolute or always clear-cut, since it can be a matter of interpretation as to where certain inscribed objects should be listed under. The instance, for example, of an attic cup inscribed with the name and the title of a king from Lydra, a relatively recent find from Despopilides' excavation here in Nicosia, which she published some time ago. Although pertaining to the private sphere, it is questionable how private a royal title can be. Uh, the separation of inscribed material in three different levels that I chose from the top up to the lower bottom was not necessarily real in the ancient world, but aims merely to facilitate my presentation. An important point to be made is that the common denominator of all these bilinguals or digraphs is that they were meant to make a statement, a statement that addressed an audience other than that of the narrow realm of literate people. The Idalio Nostraco from the archive that you saw earlier, which was an official document, is written in one and a single script. No public statement needed to be made. No one needed to see two scripts, or two languages for that matter, used on the same document. So starting with coins, they are the official declaration of state sovereignty. And as such, they bore images and text that was meaningful and imbued with symbolism at both the figurative as well as the textual level. Cypriot coins bear usually rather lengthy legends in this elaborate. Uh, and here um, we see a variety of issues of silver coins of the king Stasikos, Stasioikos of Marion, dating to the second half of the fifth century. On coins, the name of the king is written, either whole or abbreviated, accompanied by the term Basileose of the king, and sometimes the name of the kingdom, in this instance, Marieuse of Marion. We do have, however, the instance of the first king of Marion who issued coins, Sasmas. Sasmas is a king with the name of Semitic etymology, and is thought that the name derives from the Semitic word SSM, probably with the addition of a Greek ending, the characteristic final S. The S that we have on the coin legend is, of course, the S that states the genitive case, 
So, Sasa Mause, as we read on the coin legend, means the coin of Sasmas. Sasmas on his coins gets a very typically Cypriot syllabic ending, Ose, so with the addition of this ending, the one, the name, on one hand is Hellenized, but it also gets the Cypriot treatment. Just in case we were wondering whether Sasmas was some Phoenician king that overtook Marion at some point during the first half of the 5th century BC, we have his father's name. Sasmas is the son of Lysandros, a man with the name of Greek, clear Greek etymology. And I'm happy to report that based on our thorough study of coins for the purposes of the corpus, a study we undertook together with the precious help of our numismatist, Evangelini Marku, we discovered that Sasmas' father's name had been erroneously so far read as Doxandros. It's now certain that the father was named Lysandros. So this is not some Phoenician king, uh, rather, he is the son of someone who was probably a Marian native. The son was either given, or I could even venture to suggest adopted, a name of Semitic etymology. In the first instance, if the name was given as such to the son, one could think of a marriage between a native man and a woman of Phoenician descent. Unfortunately, we rarely have mother's names, so we don't really know whether matrilineal descent could have had some bearing on the son's name. Sasmas went, however, a step further into proclaiming and affirming his Phoenician side. He issued a coin with a legend in the syllabary in the obverse, uh, but in the Phoenician script on its reverse. The reverse preserves the letters ML, which have either been interpreted as an abbreviation for the name of Marion, or as the Phoenician word MLK, Melek, which is the word for king. So far, in Cypriot numismatics, this is a unique instance where the two languages and the two scripts mix, so we don't really understand what this proclamation meant, uh, what was its purpose, and whether this presumed purpose was successful or not. On the other hand, confirming the suggestion that the alphabet was in fact a later phenomenon, the syllabary intersects with the alphabet on coins only as late as the fourth century. Since we are in Marion, according to the studies of Anders Struber, there's a second king, Timocharis of Marion, for whom I have no image here, presumably to be dated around the mid fourth century. And here dates are important because they show the dates of infiltration of the alphabet, progressive infiltration of the alphabet. This king, this Timocharis, who issues coins with the abbreviation of his name and his title, Pa Ti, Basileos Timocharis, accompanied by their transcription in the alphabet. So he has Vita and Alpha, Ba, Vasilias, and Mari on the obverse in the alphabet. The alphabet is still a supplement, however, because the name of the king does not appear in the alphabet still one needed to know how to read the syllabary in order to attribute the coin to King Timocharis. And then comes a second king by the name of Stasikos, the first one to issue gold coins in Marion, with legends both in the syllabary and the alphabet, and you see here his coins. The iconography of the coins also clearly changes course, in that it becomes more Greek, and less how the tradition of Cypriot coinage in the 5th century had accustomed us to. By the end of the 4th century, we have a king, Menelaios of Salamis, the brother of Ptolemy and Estrategos, who appropriates the coin iconography of the last kings of Salamis, and issues coins with his name accompanied by the abbreviation Pa, the initial syllable of the royal title again. It is 306 BC that we have the last attestation of the syllabary on coin legends, which are from then on to be written exclusively in the alphabet. Still, at the official level, a unique honorific inscription from Amathus dating to the 4th century BC attests to both the syllabary and the alphabet, but besides terming it a digraph, it is also a clear bilingual inscription. The Greek text is in the Greek alphabet, but the syllabic text attests to the Ethiocypriot language. This is an instance in which we could advocate for bilingualism in Cyprus. Whoever read the syllabary could read both the Greek 
and the ETF separate languages, since we have no instance of the syllabary being used to record both languages on the same inscription. One could, of course, make the case that Greek language speakers, presumably unable to understand the Ethiocypriot text, could resort to the alphabetic text, assuming they knew how to read the alphabet. And by the fourth century, it appears that knowledge of the alphabet was spreading in Cyprus, and it was spreading fast. Another probable royal inscription was found in Salamis, and is dated by the shape of the alphabetic letters to the 5th century BC, and here I need to note that this is an advantage that alphabetic epigraphy has over syllabic uh, epigraphy. In the syllabary, we have very little um, evolution, so we, can, uh, we have great difficulty dating based on the shape of the signs, whereas our alphabetic colleagues can help us sometimes with these inscriptions. So the editor of the inscription, of this particular inscription, was tempted to identify the person mentioned, uh, Evagoras of Salamis, with a king that ruled the city from 411 until 374, a known alphabetophile, since he, was, he allowed the alphabet, he was the first to allow the alphabet on his coins. Another royal dedication was found in Soloi and can be pinpointed by the shape of the alphabetic letters again to the mid fourth century. It is a dedication of the king Stasius to the goddess Athena. So it is not clear from the photograph, but the squeeze shows it better. Uh, it shows that both inscriptions, and here is what remains of the alphabetic one, and here is the syllabic one, uh, both inscriptions were probably carved by the same craftsman. Uh, the tool used was the same for both scripts. It has the same uh, thickness and everything. The signs have corresponding sizes. The inscriptions are placed in juxtaposition, the alphabetic starting from the left and the syllabic from the right. So it is clear that the inscription was conceived from the beginning as a unity, and it was executed as such. For the last quarter of the fourth century, we have a dedication by King Nicocles of Paphos to the temple of Artemis, again, Agrotera. It is the only digraph we have in which the syllabary uh, used was the Paphian, written dextroverse, as was the case with Paphian. Again, from the last quarter of the fourth century, we have two royal dedications from Amathus, very difficult um, inscriptions because they're badly preserved, the Cypriot Aphrodite. Both of them are in a bad state of preservation, and that's an understatement. Here's what's left of their dedications. So far, we have one Phoenician and syllabic dedicatory inscription that dates to the fourth century and falls within the reign of King Milchiaton of Idalion and Kition. It comes from Idalion, and it is a dedication to Reshef Mikal by the Phoenician prince Balrom, the son of Abdimik. In the syllabic text, Apollo takes the epithet Amiklos. The main text, the text of origin, appears to have been the Phoenician text, whereas the syllabic is the secondary one. The bilingual and the graphic inscription attempts to address both communities residing in Cyprus, not only through the use of language, not only through the use of the language and the script, but also through the epiclesis of their respective deities. At this point, I need to make a comment that concerns bilingualism. I called the instance of the Amathos honorific inscription in which the syllabary records Ethiocypriot, um, the Ethiocypriot language and the Greek alphabet records Greek, a clear bilingual. Most of the other syllabic and Greek alphabetic digraphs that I show you could also, however, be termed, in a sense, bilinguals. From the evidence we have at our disposal, it seems nearly certain that the syllabary is exclusively connected to the recording of the Cypriot dialect, and the Greek alphabet is undoubtedly connected at this time to the Koine, the form of Greek that prevailed in the Greek-speaking world from the fourth century onward. When, um, when writing in the syllabary, what was written was the Cypriot dialect. When written in the Greek alphabet, what was written was the Koine. 
So the Koine, a development of the Attic Ionic Greek dialect, which was used here, where you see the green, mostly, um, is what later became known as Standard Greek. Until the development of the Koine in the Hellenistic period, there was no single language or dialect that was spoken throughout the Greek world. This fact also creates a problem as to our terming the different versions of Greek spoken throughout the Greek world as dialects, since a dialect implies a particular form of speech that derives from a main branch. But before the Koine, there never existed a main or common branch of the Greek language to speak of. As a matter of fact, there were dialects that could be understood more than others. There were dialects that were used and diffused more than others in the sense that they were connected to a variety of literary or epigraphic genre. The use of one or the other dialect was not necessarily connected to a person's birthplace, but it had more to do with cultural habits and preconceived notions of which dialect was more suited for what. And here I will use another of examples that I found in a paper by Anna Morpurgo, by the late Anna Morpurgo. Ancient Greek tragedies were written in Attic, with the chorus verses, as we all remember from school, in some form of Doric. Hesiod and Pindar were both from Boeotia, but both wrote in an epic language a composite form of Ionic. Hippocrates was from Kos, uh, where the Doric dialect was used, but the Hippocratic corpus was composed in Ionic. Lyric poetry could be in Eolic, but literary prose could not. Epigraphic evidence, on the other hand, which is what we mainly have in Cyprus, does not always conform to the map, this lovely map of distribution of ancient Greek dialects that we have in mind. There seems to have been a concerted effort to expunge local idioms or dialectal features deemed too strong or not appropriate enough for writing a fact which means that people were conscious of dialectal differences and the social advantages or disadvantages that went with them. All this evidence causes our dear linguists to disagree on what we should exactly term as language and dialect, two terms that we would dearly like to be able to specify with precision. So, a passage from Socrates' Apology is quite telling in this respect, and I will read to you. On the other hand, it is again Plato from whom we gain the impression that speech in one's own dialect was respectable even in Athens. At the beginning of the Apology, Socrates pleads ignorance of the correct expressions to be used in a tribunal, explains it with his inexperience, and concludes, Atechnosun xenos echo, he then argues that if he had really been a Xenos, a foreigner, he would have certainly been forgiven if he had spoken in the accent and manner in which he had been brought up. Terminology, the use of Xenos here, and context guarantee that here the reference is to a Greek dialect and not to a foreign language. We can infer that it was feasible to speak uh, in an Athenian tribunal in one's own dialect. So what this passage tells us is that uh, people conceived what we call nowadays, quite liberally, dialects, almost in terms of a foreign language, and I would stress almost. The difference being in the accent and manner, the phony, tropo, as the text says, in which one was brought up. Therefore, in the instance of Cyprus and the Cypriot dialect, Although we usually refer to it with the generic term Greek, the differences between ancient Greek dialects, dialects were such that we could speak of notably divergent linguistic constructs, which were undoubtedly perceived as such by their contemporaries. It is for this reason that when the written code switches from the syllabary to the Greek alphabet, the language does not follow suit, but stays put. The new written code does not attempt the alphabet never attempts to record the Cypriot dialect. Instead, it switches to the dialect or language it came with, the Koine. Okay. The second social level of script 
uh, script used addressed in this presentation is the semi-official, and it consists of funeral inscriptions, signature graffiti on public buildings in foreign lands, and dedications of private citizens to divine entities. What is interesting here is that unlike the official digraphs, which multiply in the fourth century, there are some digraphs at this level that come from earlier centuries, starting with the sixth century. The semi-official level presents a different angle of the story of the interaction between the scripts employed in Cyprus. Unlike the official, royal, or civic inscriptions that obviously seek to make a public statement, these ones are commissioned by private individuals who presumably had no need or political pressure to produce a digraph, and yet they did. There's this unique, so far, uh, instance of a 7th or 6th century funerary stella from Curion with the inscription in the syllabary above, which is this one, and an inscription in Phoenician below. Uh, it is difficult to deduce um, at this um, inscription which language or script was given primacy, if any, because both inscriptions seem to have been carved by the same craftsman because you see the size of the signs and everything, they have many similarities. But there's another clue that permits us to give primacy to the Phoenician factor, since the inscriptions are carved on a tombstone that follows a pattern of the so-called Phoenician window, and is a type of a tombstone quite diffused at the time throughout the Phoenician-speaking world. The oldest and this is a very well-known inscription, funerary inscription in the syllabary in the Greek alphabet, dates to the middle of the 6th century and is a typically Cypriot funerary epigram, very laconic, Karuxe emi, I am the tombstone of Karux. Incidentally, this was one of the first digraphs to be discovered in the 19th century and was of vital importance to the decipherment. Another syllabic and alphabetic funerary inscription dates to the 6th century and bears the simple name Cassikeneta, Cassignotas, the Cypriot word for sibling, and in this instance, a, si a sister. It is a rather unusual tombstone when a person is designated simply as someone's sister and the name is not given, but, uh, or their patronym, the name of the father, is not given, as was the Cypriot uh, habit expressed through the syllabic inscriptions. Additionally, it is odd that the small side, this one was chosen for the syllabic inscription, which is clearly the main one, and the inscription is written vertically, which is an apex. Uh, it's a unique instance. And I don't know if you can see it clearly, this is the Greek inscription written from right to left, because this is the sixth century. So, um, after these inscriptions, the next ones coming from the semi-official, semi-private sphere all date from the 4th century onwards. There's this one tombstone which is unfortunately lost, and it's a pity we cannot examine it because in the alphabet it has a rather dramatic text. It says, I'm dead already and the soil covers me and I was a good man and all those things. And, I would, and you see the separate one next to it is just, I'm Onassas, the son of, <laughs> which, which is very laconic, I would say. But this is lost, so we don't have much to say on this. And after these um, early inscriptions, the next ones all date from the fourth century onward. There's one tomb, sorry, um, a short notice concerns alphabetic Greek and Phoenician. We have minimal evidence for these, namely two inscriptions. Alphabetic Greek and Phoenician digraphs and bilinguals are a phenomenon that is attested more generally in the Eastern Mediterranean and reaches as far as central Mediterranean with an inscription from Malta, which was incidentally instrumental to the decipherment of Phoenician in the, 19th in the 18th century. It spans from the beginning of the first century, this phenomenon, until the beginning of the Roman period, when the Latin script started covering everything. In the instance of Cyprus, the two Greek alphabetic and Phoenician inscriptions attested are a funerary epigram, which you see here, and a dedication of which I was not, I was unfortunately not able to find the photograph. And both seem to abide to the Greek funerary formulae conventions rather than the Phoenician. One clue to this observation is, for instance, that the Phoenician formula 
included the name of the deceased's father, the patronym, but also the paponym of the person mentioned. So the grandfather was also mentioned. And this is a purely Phoenician habit. Um, after the syllabary was substituted by the alphabet, some digraphic Greek alphabetic, Phoenician alphabetic inscriptions appear, but then, by that time, they are part of a larger story happening between the Greek-speaking and the Phoenician-speaking worlds in the Hellenistic period. And at that time, there, seems, there does not seem to be anything specifically Cypriot about the late semi-official interaction between those two writing systems. <coughs> The most intriguing set of evidence, at least I find it intriguing, in this sphere are the graphic graffiti in Karnak in Egypt and in, other, in some other sites in Egypt. It is the evidence uh, that the same person was literate in both scripts because it is the same person writing their name in the alphabet as well as the syllabary. And uh, by the fourth century, this person felt uh, that he needed to make his presence known through both writing systems. A mercenary here commemorates his presence in Egypt by engraving his name on a temple of Achoris at Karnak. At the same level, we know of two sanctuary dedications, one on the left and one on the right, you see, in the syllabary and Greek alphabet. The one on the left is uh, to Dimitra and Cori, the daughter, and the other one, which was found in Beirut, is dedicated to Asclepios. And the most well-known instance of syllabic and alphabetic digraphic inscriptions, and it is the latest, um, one of the latest attestations of the syllabary anyway, are the vase dedications to the nymphs in Kafizin, which date to the third century BC. The extremely few syllabic and Phoenician inscriptions we have also date to the fourth century. You see here two well-known inscriptions from Tamasos, the first on the left, is a dedication to the Phoenician god Reshef, which corresponds in the syllabic text, text with Apollo Ilates. The one in the middle, the one on the right, is again a dedication to Reshef, but this time he corresponds to an Apollo Alasiotas. Both are dedicated by Phoenicians during the, the reign of the same king that was mentioned before, Milkiaton of Kition and Idalion. So the third level is the private, which I mentioned. And this level contains very short inscriptions, either the name of the person who owned um, or to the person who took with them <laughs> the vase, or an abbreviated form, his initials. Uh, these are post-firing inscriptions found under the bottom of Attic vessels, which found their way to Marian tombs by the hundreds. Uh, it is probable that the inscriptions existed already and the vessels were used during the person's lifetime, as I told you earlier, denoting ownership, which extended in the afterlife. The habit seems to start at the uh, fifth century and continues all the way to the fourth century. In some instances, however, the evidence provided to us by the tombs, and I need to repeat that, is that some of the vases were acquired on purpose in order to be deposited as grave goods and were inscribed precisely for the occasion. The alphabetic inscription seems in most instances to copy the syllabic, but in some cases it is the alphabetic that appears to become the main inscription with the syllabic following its lead. Additionally, uh, the problem we have is that the two don't always correlate. You see the transcription between the syllabic one. So it, it makes us wonder whether those who incised actually knew what they were writing. Uh, I have no idea, and the, they probably didn't either. The numerous Marian vases with their modest inscriptions provide us, however, with additional interesting evidence on how people, their languages, and their scripts coexisted. This evidence concerns the graphic inscriptions, but this time in a sort of monogrammatic fashion, in which the two writing systems, the syllabary and the Greek alphabet, are actually joined, ligatured, as our terminology would have it. This is the instance of a ligatured uh, alphabetic epsilon, which is this one, very well known epsilon, with two syllabic signs, the syllabic equivalent of epsilon, which borrows some of the lines used for the alphabetic ones, and here is the sign for law, 
So we think that this reads an epsilon, a Greek epsilon, an alphabetic epsilon, and elo in the syllabary, all joined together and using the lines of each sign. Ligatures and abbreviations appear as a quite usual phenomenon in the syllabary. But among the multitude of vase graffiti in Marion, we also have a few that involve exceptionally both writing systems, which I find very fascinating. So there's a similar instance of an alphabetic alpha, this one, very clear, joined together with a syllabic alpha, which is this one, which makes use of some of the lines that were used for the alphabetic sign as well. They're joined together as a ligature. The whereabouts of the vases that bore this per, uh, particular ligature are unknown. A number of vases excavated by Max Onefalschrichter in the Marion Necropolis in 1886 are now lost. The excavator, however, at the time, had made paper squeezes of their graffiti and had sent them to his collaborator, Wilhelm Decke, a researcher of the syllabary based in Strasbourg. It is in the University Library of Strasbourg, among Decke's bequest, that I discovered the paper squeezes of inscriptions on vases now unaccounted for, such as the one that you see here. Yeah. And as I mentioned previously, ligatures and name abbreviations are not an unusual phenomenon in the syllabary, and the number of these can be seen on the Marion vases. Here you see the ligatured version of the beginning of the name Onasako, Onasagoras. So you see here, O is composed of these, and should have one horizontal line, but it uses the top line of na, which is this sign. So this is a ligature of o and na. And then sa and ko, o na sa ko, reads the name. And we have another one which is more artful, I find. So again, o, na, sa, and ko, all bind together. Uh, again, a paper squeeze from Strasbourg. So, ligatures. They're not only something people wrote in their private, so to speak, documents, such as their signature graffiti on their funerary vases. So it was not only an everyday thing or a makeshift inscription. But abbreviated ligatures also appear on coins. It means that people at the highest social level, as represented by coin legends, as well as ordinary people, as the ones buried in the Marian cemeteries, were equally at ease with the syllabary and were confident that their message could get through, and that people would not be confused by the ligatured signs. Instead, they could read them. Summing up, as I hope to have shown you in this short presentation, the matter of how people, languages, and scripts coexisted within the same environment for centuries um, is not a simple or straightforward one. We do have more evidence than before, and we have made some progress on the study of the syllabary and the Cypriot Phoenician writing systems, both of which are, until now, poorly known due to the low number of documents that are preserved. Questions that deserve to be addressed in the future concern, among others, the level and quality of literacy in the Cypriot society in the first millennium BC, a society that was by definition multicultural but also lived in a fast-changing world, that of the Mediterranean of the first millennium BC. It is probable that somewhere in there also lie some answers that can be of interest to us, modern scholars and public alike, not only for the sake of solving ancient puzzles, but also for the benefit of solving some modern ones. Thank you very much.
You mean they copy? They copy, yes. Mm-hmm. Everything is written by two by people. Two. So the inscriptions were commissioned. Yes, no. The, the people they say write my name. Hmm. To someone. Yeah, so they commissioned them. Yes. So this is maybe in the case of the um, this is a very interesting uh, question. We don't really know who knew how to read and write. I think, in a sense, we're pretty certain that um, our societies, human societies, until the Second World War, the people who knew how to read and write were rather limited. And it's not, I mean, in pre-war societies, we have the picture, the scribe, there was one person in a village who knew how to write and everybody would go to them and they would have their letters written and this person would read the letters they would receive and it, it was just one person. So, but by use of that analogy, that person, the literate person, he was not an upper class person because uh, writing was, was um, a technology, it was a tool, a working tool. So he was basically the person who knew how to write, was a craftsman. Not in the sense that we mean someone who makes chairs, or maybe in that sense, but um, let's not forget that architects, for instance, we consider them as great artists nowadays, but architects in antiquity, they were craftsmen. They, they didn't have an upper, they, they, they did not belong to upper levels of society. It is possible, why? But it was, it was always manual work. Writing was always manual work. So to carve a stone, for instance, there was nothing noble about it. It was, knowledge is always power in a sense, but it was the power to lift you up from the lowest level, maybe to a middle level. But um, we don't really know whether people belonging to the upper levels of society could read or write. You are right in that we tend to think that it was professionals, it was a limited, um, someone who accompanied those mercenaries in Egypt, for instance, they needed someone who could write for them because that was also a side of their profession. They needed to correspond, they needed to read orders or something, so this person could have serviced them. What I'm trying to say is that, uh, of course, we don't know exactly, mm -hmm. but the knowledge of uh, writing mm -hmm. was limited. Yes, Very yes, limited. yes. We agree on that. But I'm not so sure what social class the people who knew how to write belonged yes. to. And I now know why. <laughs> there was a reason. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. Also. decision. You mean if they were written together uh, and served the same purpose? Because the graphic means that it was written for, for same, yeah. uh, purpose on the same, uh, on the same location. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think to do with the text, the text. above. A digraph. Casual, just something that was there accidentally. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. It was uh, because we do not have uh, the same text. Mm -hmm. You mean these ones, or yes. okay? Uh, so the first uh, inscription is painted. The second one is inside. No. Inside. So 
all of them are, are, are incised. Yes, but uh, the inscription, the diagraphic inscription, mm -hmm. has to be um, in the knowledge of two scripts. Mm -hmm. The alphabet. Uh, uh, alphabet. Yeah. It's not the case of most of them. Some of them are important. Again, you mean these ones? Uh, the Marion vases, for instance. No. The, uh, because these are all incised and they are made by the same tool as well. It's very evident when you see them. Uh, most of the sizes correspond. No, uh, I mean A different one. Sorry. Okay, we so don't. These are not, this is just important and. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, that's another category. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I just thank you very much. It was a very clear lecture and uh, we were able to follow it and learn a lot. Even prehistorians. <laughs> yeah. No, it, I think uh, my answer would be that there are two reasons. It does come down to the chance, chance discoveries. Um, it's an accident of an excavation. In Paphos, we have, it's not, I, I have no idea whether we have more excavations, but if you bump into a site that has 115 inscriptions, <laughs> you don't need many of these. You just need one site. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Yes, Rantidi. Yes. The, these was the 150 that I was saying. Rantidi was together. Yes, it's the whole, it's the whole corpus of Paphos, basically two sites. Um, it is possible that some inscriptions go unrecognized. Not everybody can see them because I show you nice photos and drawings and everything. It's not always like this. Sometimes I, I get the object on my hands and I can't find the inscription for five minutes. Where is it? <laughs> and I keep on looking. So they're not readily visible to the untrained eye sometimes. Um, this could be... Yeah. 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 So far, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. There is this also. Um, so, uh, generally speaking, this, this this discrepancy in epigraphic production between, generally speaking, the Greek world and Cyprus. So, in Cyprus, we are in the first millennium. We do have a different writing system, and what it is generally called as the epigraphic habit appears to be quite different. We have categories of finds here, of objects that are inscribed, that are usually not found in the Greek world, although I have to say that having, um, uh, having had a close en encounter with classical epigraphy, it's not that they don't have everything, they don't care. They have so many stone inscriptions, they couldn't care less about vase inscriptions and about these vases, for instance. They were 300. It took me three years. They don't care because they can't spend three years to get one sign in the syllabary. We have to do it because we don't have any other. We, we can't afford to throw away one sign. We can't afford to. So uh, 
the, the projection that we get from the publications is that there were different habits. Um, there's this general theory, I don't know, generalizing theories are usually not accurate, that it was democracy, Athenian democracy after a certain point that needed to produce uh, inscriptions, public documents, because democracy wants its citizens informed. So you write your laws and you put them up, you write the decisions by uh, the parliament and everything, and you put them up in the market so that people can read them. Kings don't do that. They couldn't care less whether their citizens are informed or not. They don't want them to be informed, basically. So they don't want them to know what is happening. They just give out orders. Or they deal with the gods. They talk to the gods directly, which is their superior, and it's the god that they're addressing. So, uh, but on the other hand, there's uh, a saying in epigraphy, you can't, I mean, even if you have one inscription, there, there was never a writing system that was invented for writing just one inscription. Where there was one inscription, there were thousands. So there was nothing to keep them from producing. For some reason, we haven't found them, and we do suspect that um, there was a lot of perishable material that was being used at the time, which we don't have. Papyrus, maybe, I don't know if we have any evidence, and parchment, and most probably, yes. as well, as well, yeah. So, w and Ostraka, that would be nice, another archive, a syllabic archive, would be lovely. <laughs> yeah. No, they're just regions, regions, neutral region. <laughs> so sorry. No, 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 we don't, no. Okay, for us, for instance, there's a, um, I wouldn't call it a clear separation line, but the syllabaries themselves, the version of the syllabaries, the Paphian and the common, it, to a certain degree would be enough for us to delineate, for instance, Paphos from the other regions. Um, then again, inscriptions move. So when, when I have a vase inscription, it does not necessarily mean that we have, I have Paphian inscriptions in Amathus. It doesn't mean that people knew how to write. All of the Paphian inscriptions that we have in, uh, in Amathus are on vases, which means that they were probably imported, they were brought in, written, or they were addressing a public that was uh, used to that. So um, frontier zones, we had this problem with uh, Drimu small village between Marion and Paphos. We didn't know what to do. Um, Drimu is, um, I think it's a clear case of what you would call a border zone. And if you go up there, you are about the same distance from Marion, the same distance from Paphos. Assuming you want to draw a line between kingdoms or whatever, um, Drimu could be anywhere. So Drimu, on the other hand, has five ins four inscriptions, sorry, five in the common syllabary. So logically, uh, if we are to follow the epigraphic evidence, it would go with the territory of Marion, because Marion uses the common syllabary and not vice versa. On the other hand, we chose to leave it, um, we did it the German way, a little bit uh, <laughs> bypass. So Drimu is listed separately. The corpus is actually, uh, number one, Amathus, uh, number two, Kurion, and we went geographically. Number three is uh, Drimu. Number four is the other problem we had, Vasa Kilaniu. Okay, Vasa only has one inscription. Uh, Vasa is on the mountains, and I know it very well because I live there <laughs> these days. <laughs> it's, uh, um, so Vasa has one inscription in the Paphian syllabary. But then again, it could be someone bringing in building material from Paphos to build a house in Vasa. Who knows? One inscription is no inscription. But then, um, when Mitford had done his 
share of the syllabary editing back in the 60s or whatever he was criticized, he had suggested that Vasa was part of Kurion, the region of Kurion. He approached it to Kurion. Then in his epigraphic treatment, he did not include it in Kurion. So we thought, we don't want to be criticized like Mitford. And we had number four is Vasa with one inscription in the Paphian syllabary. You can do whatever you want with it. You can call it a border zone. You can <laughs> and the fifth is uh, Marion. So that was our solution. We think quite Solomontian or yes. something. You can do whatever you want with this material. <laughs> it's your problem. <laughs> uh, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Can I say, uh, the, 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 um, the digress that I show you, this is what we have. I try to show you everything, and maybe I even exaggerated with salamis. <laughs> um, we don't have that much material to discern patterns. So um, when, when examining bilinguals, linguists try to discern patterns, and they do try to see if there are, if these are if there are formulas, formulaic expressions that are transferred, because every language has this, and uh, the writing system follows those as well. There's no specific pattern, uh, I'm sorry to say. So in some of uh, the fourth century uh, inscriptions, you see the, the wish, Agathi um, Tihi, which is very typically Greek. It is transferred to the Cypriot syllabary, um, they tried because gamma is a, is a tricky uh, sort of sound to <laughs> transfer to other uh, writing systems. Um, but it is the formula itself comes, I think, from the Greek world. But we do have a, only a couple of instances of this thing. Then we have purely syllabic inscriptions that do present us with this formula. So maybe this could be an infiltration of um, habits from the Greek world from the back door uh, in some sense. But um, the norm is that um, they tend to follow the writing system went along with specific cultural habits like um, the cultural habit I show you uh, tomb inscription. My name and the name of my father. That's it. There's no longer text to tell you how sorry I am, I'm dead and everything. This is very lyric, this is very, this is very Greek. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're not they're not copying that usually because they don't know how to do it. They they don't care basically. So as a simalalun, as if the stone is speaking. The stone, the stone can speak. But it I'm sure it can. <laughs>
in the nominative. Okay, we have a problem. Most of our inscriptions are in the genitive. So I am of that person, which makes more sense. We do have some instances where um, the problem is we don't really know the separate version of the name to be able to understand what the hell the name is. We have instances that it looks like a genitive and it actually um, it doesn't conform to the rules that we would expect a genitive to have and it actually appears to be a nominative. So my impression from the instances that we studied for the first volume, because the problem was when you try to transcribe it, the, in the apparatus criticus, you need to write just one comment, nominative, genitive, it's one word. And it was so difficult because we couldn't understand uh, what the declination involved there was. So it seems that some of the earlier inscriptions, and I'm not talking, I mean, maybe I'm talking about five or four or five cases, but it was so repetitive. We have this confusing nominative with an S that passes as a genitive. It's the oldest inscriptions, it's the Paphian inscriptions as well. We have it uh, in some vases and inscriptions that we can date until the seventh century, the sixth century. This confusing thing then stops. Um, we don't really know the initial form, how the name was pronounced and what it was, but there was there's something peculiar being done there. We think it's a nominative. It is a nominative. They use the nominative. That passes as a genitive. I don't. I can't explain it exactly. <laughs> No. No, no. No, no, no. Because it's a uh, philolaos, I don't know. They're, they're names that are otherwise recognizable. But uh, the writing system has specific rules. You have to write things in a certain way. Uh, you can make spelling mistakes. You're allowed to use alternate orthography. There's no strict method you need to use that. There seems to be liberty. But at the same time, there are rules for doing things. So when the earlier inscriptions don't abide to these rules, we're a bit at a loss. And we try to be to make as mess as less statements as possible in this case. So we hope that in the future, if we have, I don't know, maybe ten more, I don't ask for more, ten more inscriptions would be lovely to see how the word forms and how is its nominative and genitive and everything. It's quite confusing. Yes, of course. That was, must have been the first place where the syllabary was introduced. But it was also the last one because we still have the syllabary in the Roman archive in the first century. Yeah, yeah. So the syllabary was still alive at the very end of the first century. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least in Paphos. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, concerning the, the inscription on the leader, it doesn't say who. Ah, it's that, okay. Well, okay. And that's quite different. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but so it's still it's still a royal Yes, but on an on an on an imported four okay. little cup mm. and we never have royal inscription or one I guess inscription on such four little So you're implying you're implying he was a low class prince. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a, it's a very strange um, incident. Mm -hmm. All the other royal inscriptions were by this is the one. I, I'm inscribed, I'm inside the room one of us. Mm -hmm. That was good. <laughs> yeah, we Thank need you so very much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>